Welcome back to another episode of A Gift from Adversity. My name is Jay Love. I'm your host. Thank you very much for tuning in. Today we have a wonderful guest. But before we introduce our guest, I want to introduce my book, which is the same title as A Gift from Adversity podcast. It's called A Gift from Adversity. Its subtitle is Overcoming Sexual Abuse, Domestic Violence, Bullying, and Homelessness. And it's available on Amazon. And I published my book in 2020. And after I published my book, I felt very compelled to share not only on book format, but create a, a podcast and really make a social media platform where people can share their adversities. But not only that, tools that they use to overcome and a gift that came from it. So I'm very grateful that today we are recording episode 81 and guests are from all over the world. So let's invite today's guest. Hi, JT. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, happy Tuesday, Jerry. Thank you for having me here. Appreciate the opportunity to share a beautiful conversation with you. Great. So JT, can you please tell our audience where you're coming in from um, and what you do, your website and the social media, et cetera? Yeah, my name is JT Sui. Uh, I am currently in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission to help show others what's possible when you go all in and truly bet on yourself. And there's many different ways in which I do that. Uh, I was a high school educator for 15 plus years. Uh, now I'm coaching, speaking, writing, podcasting. So just finding new uh, ways, new opportunities to reach and meet people where they're at. And then what is your website or social media that people can follow you? Yeah, the social media is across um, the same, across all social media, Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. It's at underscore JT underscore Sui. It's so for any of their watching live, it's it's in the name there. And my website is www.jtsui, all one word, dot com. And what can people find on your website? Yeah, they can find a little bit more about uh, one of the adversities that I experienced in my life and how I uh, chose to turn it into a beautiful gift. Uh, they can learn more about uh, a book I wrote titled You Are Greatness. Uh, they can learn more about you know the coaching, the speaking aspect, but, but really just a, a, an opportunity to kind of just get a glimpse and better understanding of who I am and how I sort of got here. Got it. So jttsui.com. Yeah. Is that the website? Yeah. Perfect. So I just put it on the comment section so people can follow. And I, I will put that on the description as well. So JT, let's jump into the first question, which is the adversity. So can you share your adversity with our audience? What was your adversity? Yeah, I, I love that question. Um, and, and, you know, I'll, I'll preface it by saying that I've had some great mentors and coaches in my life that have really helped me to get a better understanding of myself, because I believe that that's where we can truly learn from adversity and turn it into a gift. And I had a great mentor that helped me understand that pain and purpose are the same coin. They're just different sides of it. And I find that as I've been able to learn that and better understand it and, and apply that principle to my life, it's actually allowed me to turn more adversity into gifts. Um, but for me, most recently, I would say the adversity that's on my heart actually stems from my relationship with my own father. And from that experience, it's been this interesting journey of self-discovery, of really learning how to navigate the ebbs and flows. But what I have found is 
the biggest change from, from the adversity was learning how to simply move forward to, to stop dwelling on the past. And, and I realized for, for many years, I stayed stuck because I chose to dwell on what the relationship wasn't. And, you know, there was a lot of, of blame, of criticism, of complaining about the way things were. And it wasn't until I had this aha where I had a friend who challenged me in a loving way with a tough question. So he loved me tough. Then I had another friend reframe and ask me again, where I really realized, you know, I, I needed to forgive and, 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 and forget and move forward. And it's been interesting that the adversity that I was sort of feeling the resistance that I had towards him, that those feelings of resentment, of frustration, of anger melted away when I simply just went and, and actually sat down with him at his, at his home and just had a conversation. And, and so it's been a beautiful gift and it's been amazing just to see what has shown up in my life, both personally, professionally, and in all aspects, just by simply um, embracing um, that adversity. So let's uh, dissect the adversity part and it can, uh, let's talk about the tools and then your friend conversation later in the podcast. So that's the okay. second question that I have. Okay. So the first question is the adversity. So okay. we are gonna ask later the tools and then the gift. Okay. But for the first part of the podcast, I wanna dissect what had happened to you, mm-hmm. adversity itself, not how you overcame yet. Yeah. Um, so the relationship you mentioned with your father, what kind of relationship did you have with your father? Yeah, you know, it early on, I would probably say in those first formative years, you know, zero to seven or eight, I remember just more positive memories for better lack of term, right? I, I remember sharing experiences, laughter with my dad, and just, there was just a a different joy and love of life. And somewhere as I transitioned into my preteen years and moving forward for the next, you know, 30, it, it, the relationship turned more combative, right? There was a lot more, um, do as I say, not as I do. And there seemed to be almost this hierarchy that was established where you know I'm your father do as I do and do as I say and that from from there it just the relationship just became uh more adversarial it became more 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 toxic and um the interesting thing is some of the aspects of our relationship that I didn't enjoy didn't look back fondly on were ones that I had known had slowly started to creep into my own relationship with my own son as I started to have it. So yeah, it was a real interesting of observing how that adversity had grown and evolved in my own relationship with my father, but then how it started to seep into my relationship with my own son. So you, did you experience any abuse or it's almost like um, verbal or more of controlling kind of emotional? Yeah, I, I would say, and, and again, this is sharing in an objective way and an understanding that my parents did the best they could based on their lived experience, based on their upbringing, based on their uh, experiences with their own parents. I grew up in a very... Um, for better lack of term, chaotic household, a lot of screaming and yelling, um, just a very, um, very intense environment. And, and I just found that I had almost become so numb to it that I thought that that was just a norm. norm. I thought that that was just how families operated, right? There was just a lot of screaming and yelling when frustration came out. Um, yeah, you just yelled. And 
it's been interesting in the last few years where I started to realize that there was this deeper level of criticism that was sort of embedded in how we talk to each other that I've really had to take some ownership of so that I can change my relationship with myself moving forward and my own kids and my wife. Yes. So let's talk about the feeling that you had when the screaming, but there's no physical or sexual abuse. It was just yelling and screaming. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, from growing up there, yeah, it was just mostly just verbal, the screaming, the yelling. Yeah. But then when they yell or scream, like, is it more condescending words? Like, um, some words that was hurtful? Yeah, there it's, it's when I, when I reflect back on, on my childhood, right. And that's what I feel that my personal growth self-development journey the last, you know, six plus years has been, has really been about just, you know, celebrating the past, harvesting from it, you know, and, and, and really, you know, just drawing from learning more about myself. Uh, I, I would say that within there, I developed this ability because I, because I, you know, growing up with two immigrant parents, they worked a lot. You know, I, I grew up, my, my, my grandparents raised my brother and I a lot. So there was a lot of like fending for myself, right? Like you'll sort of figure it out. Um, and I, and I realized that it did allow me to develop this uh, sense that, you know, if I want something, I'll figure it out, right? I'll, I'll take responsibility. But I also realized the other side of the coin there was there was this level of uh, self-criticism that was also embedded in that, that, you know, I, I am, you know, and I still work on this to this day, you know, sometimes my own harshest critic, which I think many people are. So, so I think within that screaming and yelling that for whatever reason, uh, I started to pick up and develop this, uh, these habitual behaviors of, of criticizing myself. And, and from there, it's, 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 it's been just interesting to observe how deeply ingrained some of that is. Yes, absolutely. And then where are they from originally? Yeah, so originally both my parents um, grew up, they were both born in, in Hong Kong, right? And then my mom, uh, when she went, she did her university in the United Kingdom. Um, my dad at that time uh, came over to uh, North America, came to Canada. Uh, his, his parents, you know, blessed him with a plane ticket, a little bit of money, and he came over here to sort of give, give life a new go. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been interesting because the more I've, I've developed some compassion for him, the more I start to understand like how challenging his journey was and how he did the best he could. But, but uh, again, that's, that's probably a conversation for later, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. So as having immigrant parents, it, but you were born in Canada, correct? Yeah. Did you experience any bullying or like anything, discrimination um, against you, your look or anything? Yeah, I think like most young people, um, you know, we, 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 many young people struggle to find their place and, and I was no different, uh, you know, Toronto, although people, what they think of Toronto now being very diverse, right, especially being very Asian prevalent, um, I would have been the norm, not the exception. Growing up here 30, you know, 30 plus years ago, it was very different. You know, I, I remember, uh, you know, just not eating the same meals as other kids in my class that I played sports with, uh, going on vacations that were different or that even just the type of shows, you know, my parents had watched were, were completely different. So, so I think for me, you add in the fact of you don't look like, you don't look like the majority of people you grow up with, your 
you know, your, your, your experience at home, very different. You, your parents come from just a different part of the world with maybe some different values, not, not good, not bad, just different. It, uh, really, um, it was very challenging for me. And again, you kick into that, that self-criticism piece, you know, it wasn't there. And, and then I do remember early on, um, being, um, being bullied, but then I quickly discovered that I had a gift for athletics and sport. And that became the tool for me to, to develop a different level of calm and confidence. And then the bullying went away, right? Because I be began to embody a different level of calm and confidence in myself. It's interesting. I had a guest a few episodes ago. His name is Sony, and he came from Vietnam. And he said similar thing. He was in the Baltimore area and never really experienced bullying, but then he had this athletic ability in a truck team, a truck star, and that kind of shifted him. Um, with his presence. So it's kind of reminding me of that. Now, on top of being different in Toronto, like 30 years ago, like you said, and then being Asian and, you know, I think I struggle as well. Sometimes I'm kind of intentional and careful when I pack lunch for my children, like say, instantly i want to pack onigiri which is the rice ball but then what will be the consequence of my children to experience that you know what i mean so like you know i've heard of these things so i try to not like i try to pack americanized like you know standardized lunch for them and mm -hmm. stuff so it's very interesting and asian culture for me from Japan and then straight from Japan, the things that I experienced in my household, JT, sometimes considered normal, but it's not normal. And mm -hmm. yelling, screaming is not okay. And then there are so many ways that we can communicate through, but then our parents' generation probably never had a mental health talk, never had a fact, a long-term effect, forget about that. and our generation, I'm 46 years old, growing up in Japan in the 80s, forget about it. So how was it in Toronto growing mm -hmm. up? Did you have any guidance counselor to navigate through this house issues that you maybe had? Um, or maybe friends or maybe mentor who understood you what was going on at all? Yeah, no, and and that and that's a, a great question. Um, you know, I've been blessed through sport, and you know, through sport, there's built-in uh, mentors and, and coaches, right? You, you get them in whatever sport you play. So, I would say one of the gifts of of being involved in sport was having an opportunity to be around so many different kind of leaders, right? And and for me, what I what I found was some of the qualities that I wasn't able to receive at home. And again, my parents did the best they could. They came to a country where they knew no one. They didn't have, you know, a, a trust fund where, where they, the where they were able to set up and, and they, they had to work to provide for our family. And, and again, the price came at that their kids had to be driven by other people had to be taken care of other people. And it is what it is. What, what I found from that, and again, reflecting back on my experience, was I started to gravitate to coaches that really poured time and energy into me. You know, they, they were the coaches that would pick me up and, and drive me to games. You know, they were the coaches that really just wanted to uh, check in with me and see how I was doing. Or, or they were the coaches that really spent a lot of time uh, helping me feel connected, right? That feeling seen, to feel heard, to feel appreciated, which is our greatest human need. So, so I found I started to gravitate to those, um, to those qualities in people. And it was interesting, you know, they, I found them in sport. I, I found them in, in certain teachers. Um, I, I didn't have a guidance counselor. Um, 
ironically enough, I became a guidance counselor when I was in education. But yeah, I did start to find I, I did start to find other people who had those qualities that I was looking for. So I guess upon reflection, it really did take a village to raise it, right? Like my parents were, you know, supported and me in, in certain ways. And then they had other adults, you know, uh, other calm and confident leaders that helped raise me into the person I am today. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, JT. And it's a very interesting conversation because sometimes, you know, we, um, I live in America now and I see multiple cultures in the background. And then as an Asian, you know, root, um, I don't think people completely understand the dynamic of the authoritative figure that say in Japan, if you're one year older, we have to immediately use the polite word. Talking back to parents, talking back to teachers, uh, absolutely no, no. Where in America, it's teenager, whoever, like gonna talk to you anyhow. And then I've never seen that growing up. And I think another struggle is living in Canada or maybe in America, because you see the comparison between your household and your social life. That so you have some sorts of some sort of sense of advocacy outside the world, but then in a household you have none. How did you balance that? Do you remember like maybe comparing with other kids who didn't have as much of controlling parents or the way that Asian culture kind of promote the authority, which definitely has pros and cons yeah it's uh it's it's been interesting i would say i i've gained a greater greater appreciation for my parents since i've had kids because i started to realize you, you know you, you start you, you start to develop a different level of empathy right because you start to see the world through their lens but you know for me it, it's been an ongoing journey and i think it's celebrating the fact of your 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 values in life change and, and i find that as i have continued to walk along there and and you know got more clarity about who i am and and what's important to me uh you know what brings me joy that that's how i've that's how i've navigated it specifically with my parents again because i was raised you know i, I grew up a lot spent a lot of time by myself I had to take responsibility, I developed some pretty good people skills. So, so I, I figured out how to, how, how to read a room, right? So those proverbial, I, I may not have had the discipline to have the book smarts, but I did develop a ton of street smarts. So, so I learned to navigate my parents. I, again, like, like many Asian parents, they had very, you know, strict rules on da, 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 da. I just learned to play the game a little bit more. So I learned how to present. I learned the areas I could push a little bit. I learned certain things to maybe stay quiet, not, not promote. But then I, I, I learned how to kind of test, test the edges, test the boundaries a little bit. It's very interesting because you're male and I'm female that in Asian culture, especially like we don't have much of the say. And then I think the boy um, culture in Asian are uh, a little bit more respected than girls. And then I think that dynamics kind of is interesting as well. And this is really interesting conversation because you were not born in Hong Kong. You are in immersed in Canadian mm -hmm. culture and then philosophy. But then your household is the world of yours that has thick Asian culture in it. Mm -hmm. And the way that you described earlier on the kiosks and that you thought it was normal. I heard a little bit earlier, but then mentally as an adult now, thinking back, how is it? affecting you as an adult for having those chaotic childhood right now? Yeah, uh, it, it's something um, I, I work on on a daily basis. Uh, what I, I, I've come to a point in my 
sort of own personal growth, self-development journey, you know, as I like to call it, my, my own journey to greatness, that I've realized that there are parts of my past where part of the experience was to simply observe what I don't want. So I've come to realize that I don't want to have a family situation where screaming and yelling is the norm. I, I, I just, I've decided that I want better for my family moving forward. Now, I will be the first to say, are there moments where they're screaming and yelling? Absolutely. What family doesn't have that? Um, but but I've, I've really learned that it just doesn't feel very good. You know, when, when, when the screaming and yelling happens, you know, if it's with my kids or something like that, it just doesn't. So, you know, I, I, I do my best to, to focus on what I do want. Some days I do it better than others. Um, but, but again, it's just, it's just feedback, right, of, of, of what's going on. So um, I try to use the lessons from the past to, to create a more compelling future. Well, thank you so much, JT. So let's actually move on to the second question, which is the tools that you use to overcome this. Um, so this is my this is our episode eighty one, and so far, every guest that I had had completely different perspective on tools that you use to overcome. And this is my favorite part of the podcast because, to me having this kind of conversation had we had this access when we were growing up i think my life would have been very different mm -hmm. and having to understand the effect long-term effect and how we could have been prevented how we had these tools available to us so mm -hmm. this is a very important part of the podcast for me um so what would you say the tools that you kind of mentioned a little bit that worked for you the most that you can share with the audience. Yeah. Uh, great question. I love that actual, right. Focus action is what actually creates change. Right. Um, for me, when I started it, I've come to believe that when you keep it simple, simple in life, you know, it, that that's really where the joy is. So for me, how that applied was, being a high quality athlete and coach, for me, movement was actually the first place I started because physically moving my body, just, I understood that there was a level of calm and confidence. And, and as anyone that, you know, spends any time in personal growth and self-development knows that whenever you move, you're just shifting energy. So, so for me, that was, was the easiest access point for me. So that's where I started when, when I first started really doing a deep dive into myself. Um, throughout the last few years, it's grown and evolved. Um, for me now, writing daily reflection uh, is, 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 is the thing that really moves the needle for me. When I get up in the morning now, and, and there's a process, I, I, do, I do follow a playbook, we'll say, um, where, I, I spend time getting my thoughts onto paper and it, I find it helps me to sort of focus my mind. And through that process, it allows me to, you know, sort of brain dump. And then I also use that, that once that starts to sort of clear up and think of it, when I wake up some mornings, it's like murky water. But then as soon as I start writing, it's like the pond gets you know, like clear and beautiful, kind of like a, a beautiful ocean, right? Those green and blue ocean gets there and then once once that becomes a little clearer then I start to uh, remind myself about where I'm going so so I find the writing serves two purposes it allows me to focus and process things and then two um, it helps me to again write the story that's going to be happening going forward and then I'll go do the you know the movement later in my day I'll, I'll, I'll integrate that the meditation but um, yeah, so it's it's evolved, and uh, so movement, daily writing, reading those those are the ones that really move the needle for me. I like that you said writing daily reflection and morning writing. I think that's really cleansing. Um, 
So, and then you mentioned earlier on about talking to your friend who asked you some question. Yeah. Well, what was the question? Do you remember? Yeah. Uh, so this was a friend who he does a lot of work. Uh, he's a, a leadership expert. Uh, works with a lot in in the business world. His passion is really around supporting dads. So he has a lot of, you know, the quote unquote um, alpha leaders. You know that you know, that are titans of industry, um, but, you know, come to him because they need some support in the, in the parenting and the fatherhood aspect. So I was out visiting him and, uh, you know, we're just sharing. Uh, we actually go back to, uh, we, we played football together in universities and, and we've just stayed connected. And um, he's one of the people that, you know, knows the deep and intimate secrets of, you know, knowledge of, of my situation, my relationship with my father. And uh, I, I just asked him what, what his thoughts were on the relationship. I, I don't ask a lot of people for their opinions. I, I, I choose to only ask people who I feel, you know, can offer me, you know, sp you know, specialized knowledge, wisdom to help me move forward. And he sort of, he asked me, he said, no, I think you're full of it. He, I, you know, and I, and I said, what do you mean? And uh, I said, I don't really care about the relationship. I'm, 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 I washed my hands of it. He's like, I don't believe you. And uh, he just asked me, you know, is that how you truly feel? And from that conversation, he planted this seed, this thought seed in my mind that it just ruminated, just ruminated. And I think I started to maybe question some, some old beliefs. And uh, from there, I just, you know, over the next two weeks, I just started really reflecting on it and sort of sparked me to have some conversations. And, you know, two weeks later, I'm at my father's long-term care facility, having a conversation with him, lots of tears about just wanting to let go of the past and move forward. And yeah, it's, 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 it's been very healing and very transformative. What are the things that you said to your father? Yeah, um, it's been interesting because again, it, it me simply going there. I mean, he had been in this long-term care facility for, for over three months and I had not gone. And uh, he was surprised when I went there first off. And we went there and, he's, and he, his initial was, oh, what do you need help with? you know, that's just the way, right? He, if I, if I asked him for money or if I asked him for anything, he would, he would give me the shirt off his back. That's just how he shows his affection. That's just how he shows he cares. And we just sat down and I, and I just said that I'm good. I, I don't need anything. I just came here to see you. And, and the more I just reassured him that there was nothing there, um, we sat and, uh, I, I just said, I, I'm, I, I'm, done blaming you for the past. I just want to forgive. I, I want to move forward because it's holding me back from experiencing more greatness in my life. And uh, again, there was a release of tears. Um, and I know for me, when, when there's tears being released, I know it's an energetic block that's, you know, going into the ethers. And um yeah, it was just a great conversation. We probably talked for 45 minutes. Um, and, and we just had conversation about life. We we laughed. Uh, we, we joked about something that we thought my mom would find funny, which I don't remember the last time him and I had an open, honest conversation. We laughed together. And then I challenged myself when I was leaving. I just told him I loved him. I, I'm not even sure the last time I've ever said those words to him. It truly meant them, but I just felt like, you know, if, if anything happens, if, if, it, if this, if my time here on, on this physical earth ends today or his does, I'm at peace that I've, 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 I've let sleeping dogs lie. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's been interesting. Every, every time we go there, I feel like I'm, I'm gaining another level of awareness. I'm so happy that you had that conversation and thanks to your friend. I know it was maybe harsh words to say in order to hear the truth. <laughs> Sometimes you know, truth hurts. And then 
I don't know why he said you're full of it, but maybe he saw it a block. Maybe he saw a pretentious of, you know, Asian culture, like we were taught to be emotionless and then very perfect in outward, but not in word. Nobody checks in on your mental health or whatsoever. That we are expected to be very plateau and then perfect in our culture, I think. I'm very happy that you had that conversation with your father. Mm -hmm. Has it really shifted your energy and then like really changed you? Yeah, the, the best way to describe it is life just feels a little bit lighter. Whenever I go to see him, it just is, it's like that simple action because I'm a firm believer, like you can, you can think about, you can talk about making all the change you want, but if there's no consistent and focused action that follows up with it, they're just words, right? And, and I, and I find for me that every time I go there, it's just, I, I'm thinking and acting as if I'm, I am that, you know, that highest version of me, right? Like that, that, that true calm and confident uh, man that I always, you know, was deserving to be. So, so I find when I go there, it just, uh, it just feels different. And, and, and I, and I feel these, um, like you mentioned there, these illusions of perfection that, that, uh, that I've also, uh, held on to for many years, um, slowly melt away. And I embrace that the imperfection of life. And that I, again, I'm just a human being on this physical planet, just having you, you know, a human experience. So yeah, I, I find I'm, uh, life just feels a little bit lighter every time I go. It reminded me of the conversation that I had with my counselor. So I had an extreme, extreme abusive father and then really challenging mom and then not as bad as my dad but my counselor every time she mentioned that she contributed my ptsd as well that i was very defensive because there's a term called angelizing so for instance um illusion of perfection that reminded me that like say even if somebody was bad or did something wrong if another person is worse then the child had to lodge onto somebody who was a little bit better. So it's called angelization. And then she said it's very unhealthy because it's almost like loving the statue. And then you have to accept the imperfection in order for you to love at full level. So I just wanted to echo and then share that with you. Yeah, and you, you bring up a great point that... Um how I would best describe it is learning to love my dad, like unconditionally, right? Regardless of what has happened in the past, you know, loving him for all his, all his blessings, loving him for all his challenges and, 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 and problems and barriers that what I'm actually doing is I'm, I'm learning to love myself. And I know that sounds so, you know, interesting in today's culture, but learning to, more and more love him unconditionally is actually allowing myself to love myself unconditionally, regardless of what is happening in my external world. So um, that's, that's what I meant by, you know, it's been very healing and transformative. It's just changing my relationship with myself. I 100% agree with you. And then I appreciate you because what you had suffered in from the childhood is definitely contributing to self-sabotage and your brain is the most powerful place on the earth where it can flip your day it can make your day happy and it's a shift that you mentioned a little bit about self-loving and then understanding whoever the perpetrator whoever the contributor of the negative brain wiring of self sabotage instead of instead of leveraging yourself it's hard when you are not taught to do that mm -hmm. 
So let's actually move on to the last question, which is a gift that came from it. So JT, again, thank you so much for being here today. And can you tell our audience, how would you say a gift that came from your adversity? Yeah, it's, uh, it's helped me to understand the power of learning to celebrate all parts of the journey not just the sunshines and rainbows and that's easy right that's positive thinking but it's truly learning that you needed to go through that and in turn it's made you into a stronger more powerful version of yourself it's made you into a more calm and confident leader and from there i find now it's actually given me the ability to to em empathize with people and, and, and show them that if I can turn that challenge, that adversity into a gift, anyone can do it. So, so, so I would say that that's been the gift is, is to just give people a, a, a glimmer of hope that, that again, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Well, thank you so much again, JT, for being here. I really appreciate our conversation. Thank you very much for having me, Yuri. So everybody, this was episode 81, A Gift from Adversity. Thank you again, JT, for coming in. And then we have more guests coming in to talk about the adversities and tools and the gift that came from it. My name is Yuri Love. I'm your host. We'll see you next time.